Welcome to another segment of Beyond the Grassy Knoll. Uh, you folks might remember, um, certainly in the most recent time, that we did uh, the Nola Palooza, about 13 hours of programming, and um, we had on actually three guests, not all together, but it was um, the Noblitz who uh, spoke to Ritual Abuse, and I think they had acted as editors for a book um, in which uh, uh, there were a number of authors who contributed, and one of them was Ellen Lachter, who you've heard on the show several times before, but Ellen was there as well. We're going to have with us today uh, someone else who was a contributor, uh, unfortunately because uh, the individual was a victim and not just somebody uh, who, like Ellen, and I'm not just minimizing that, uh, deals with individuals uh, as much as the case with our guest today. Uh, this person actually um, was involved with it and was a victim. And without uh, delaying any further, we want to welcome Trish Fotheringham to the program. Uh, and Trish, thanks a lot for coming on to speak to what we always call a pretty, like, best kept and dirty little secret in our cultures. Thank you for having me. No problem. Um, now, you also, as I said, uh, you have a, con a contribution to that book, do you not? Yes, I do. I wrote Chapter 24. Um, it's called Patterns in Mind Control, a first-person account. Okay. And uh, do you have um, at least a short title for that book that um, um, they put out? The, the Ritual Abuse in the 21st Century, Psychological, Forensic, Social, and Political Considerations. Well, you had the long title, didn't you? <laughs> so, okay. it, it seems to make sense. <laughs> Sure. Now, uh, I guess it may be tried to say, but it's, it's certainly, I think, uh, applicable here that the best place to start is at the start. So how, how did this all happen to you? Um, and what is it that did happen to you, if you can share with us that? Okay, basically I was born into it um, from birth. Um, my mother was part of a kind of healing magic matriarchal cult, and they had um, a few weird little rit rituals. Um, things like, you know, test for your power with water dunking at six months, that kind of strange stuff. Yes. Um, and my dad was in a kind of patriarchal family clan that sort of had druidic-style practices and um, some odd, weird rituals, too. And then um, through my stepfather, or my dad's father, my dad's stepfather, my mother um, was connected with a what I... I understood at the time was a military group. Um, I don't know if it actually was. Um, and basically I was enrolled in a mind controlling program, uh, a mind control training program as a demonstration model so that they could demonstrate just how thoroughly they could split the human mind into controllable little pieces that they could slay, uh, right. be slaves and do what they're told. All right, let me ask you this to, be, to clarify. First of all, the military involvement may have been in what? In backing this group to see what would happen? Um, yes, I believe it was, um, well, like all the men, all the people involved wore military, Canadian military uniforms, but I don't, I think they might have been doing stuff on their own time. And, um, but it was definitely that they were, um, looking at, um, controllable slaves, and, and, and I was a model of how that could be done. Yeah, and the other thing I wanted to clarify, but you already done that, uh, we've had people on to speak to, uh, military involvement in the States. But, in fact, uh, this is, took place in Canada. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so with that, with that mind control training, they knew that at some point it, that, that, that would all break down. And then when that occurred, when I was no longer useful to them, there was all kinds of reprogramming and shutting me down and making me basically what, what I call discarded, making me into a, a guaranteed failure with no credibility kind of thing. Um, that was in my teens. That part happened. And in with all of this stuff, um, off and on over the years, there was medical experiments with things like um, the effects of, on the human body of microwaves and electrical currents and on out, um, testing stuff about out-of-body experiences, too. Right. My hand... Pardon? All right, let me, let me just take you back so we can categorize this. Mm -hmm. uh, from, from, obviously, before your memory, uh, you had been subjected to, shall we say, cult-like practices... From birth, from birth, because there was training. Some of the training started right at birth. Um, the initial splits were, were done, the initial um, dissociative splits were done right at birth uh, to okay. uh, with, within minutes. All right, and uh, what, what and took place uh, 
say, during your grammar school years? Ah, uh, grammar school years. Um, oh, there was a lot of training. I was trained um, as a sex slave. I was trained as a soldier. I was trained as an oracle, voice of the gods, preacher. I was trained as um, some spy stuff. Uh, like being able to, you know, pay attention and stuff, uh, see things that others didn't notice. Um, I was trained with with some of that stuff. I was trained in with martial arts and weapons and stuff. And so this was going on from the time you were, well, if we're talking about school, down here, grammar school, elementary school would be somewhere around kindergarten to sixth or eighth grade. Actually, it started from birth, and each of the um, training paths, I was ge- given basically nine training paths that they wanted me to follow that they were going to do and um the 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 training for each path each altar all the altars in that path started from birth and progressed um so that a lot of the stuff like the sex slave stuff and the soldier stuff my altar personalities didn't even understand it wasn't normal life i was just being trained up to be a little soldier or a little sex toy or all right, so but you were you were cognizant this was taking place. It wasn't like they had created MPD and you didn't know what was going on, or, or yeah. Uh, well, I mean, no, I didn't exactly know. Each part, each altar, only knew about themselves usually, and um, and I didn't really. Uh, it, it, there was amnesic barriers trained in, so that I didn't remember the stuff until I was in my thirties in training. Or right, so actually, while you were I mean, going- in therapy, in therapy. So while you were going to school, as a somewhat, I guess, apparently, to at least those around you, uh, a reasonably adjusted child, Mm -hmm. that was anything Mm -hmm. but uh, from the that was anything but the truth. Yes, yes. Now was this something? Was this something that was going on? Um, I mean, while children were going home to you know to participate in sports or clubs or just go home and do homework, were, were you being diverted somewhere else where this took place? Um, sometimes. Sometimes more of it was at night and in the evening, though. Um, but sometimes, yeah, there was sometimes things like I had to uh, neighbors would be brought in, and I'd have to do a little strip tease for them after school and go have sex with them or something. All right, and was there at any point as you developed uh, where you started to sense if you really could nail it down? Were you sensing something was wrong ever at any of this uh, during this time? Um. Hmm. I kind of. Let me ask you this: was Knew any... I was different. I knew I was different. And at nine years old, at at one point, when all of this had made my physical body start showing disabilities, and I was in and out of the hospital a lot, uh, it started to leak out when I'd be under, you know, very sick and lack of oxygen or under the medications, and I'd start telling. Um, what was happening, and then they labeled that crazy talk and did a whole bunch of programming around it. And I should be a little more specific, too, because I'm wondering, even if, uh, in a psychological sense, um, you you may have felt something wasn't quite right. Physically, did you pop up with anything where you said, gee, that's interesting, where did that come from? Um, the only real incident I remember of that was when I was 10 years old, and I'd been in the hospital, and I um, was going, I had been in the hospital for a number of weeks and with my asthma. And the, the staff said that I couldn't go home. I had to go to a local institution for children that, that were very sick. And I had to go and stay there. And my response was, oh, good, I can get away from my parents. And I never understood what that was about until I was in therapy in my 30s. And so, finally it made sense. So you had some kind of uh, subconscious understanding that you didn't like being around them yeah i think some of the altars knew that that they weren't good but it was all disconnected and i'd always been fragmented and disconnected so i didn't know there was any other way to be now of course i don't know the way this works as far as the petitioning of one's uh, mind but is there any such thing as one of those personalities which might be more dominant starting to for lack of better words spill over into another persona or even the persona you have as Trisha? Um, yeah, they did some of the, sometimes. Um, and I, I wasn't set up to have just one altar at a time. They set me up to have four, a combination of four at any given time functioning. Um, so it, 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 it made me look normal, but I, I felt very disconnected. But some parts were more aware. I had one altar 
that actually was self-created when I was six, that we created her like Nancy Drew, the, the detective in the kids' books. Right. Uh-huh. And um, she kind of hovered around everywhere collecting all the information she could about everything. But there was only very limited circumstances where she could actually come out and do anything about it or let us know anything. Uh, it, it, it's, it's very calm. <laughs> how, to, how to explain it? Some altars that were out-of-body altars mm-hmm. were more aware. Um, emotions could leak through or strange ideas that didn't make sense to the part that was having them that were leaking through from other parts. But it really, I, I, it really wasn't evident to me until I was in, in my 30s and started therapy. Now, you, you refer to uh, these other well, you, you, let's just call them alters, okay? Mm-hmm. That's the mm-hmm. term you use. You might understand that also as what that would also be considered multiple personality? Yes, yes. At, at, at the point when it was as many alters as I um, ended up with, it was about 150 of them. And from the people I know, that was a very small number um, based on what I went through. And it's because the, the training was done in such a way to make character development, and um, and my theater was a big part of my family's background and tra- and part of what went on. So much of this was tricks and theater and stuff. That somehow my some of my alters or one of them or something came to an understanding of creating a like a character that can be developed instead of just every incident creating a fragment. Right. So I had I had alters that took a range of things instead of just one thing. What was the benefit uh, to your parents? for um, giving you over to something like this? Um, I believe the way I understand it is that my dad didn't actually know about it at first. Um, where I believe my understanding is that my, my dad's stepfather and my, my mother ca- ca- um, were the ones that did this. And I, it was during the Cold War times, and I actually believe my mother thought she was doing something good because the way I understand it is that she, I was... She was supposed to get social social status, and I was supposed to get um, higher education and and much more opportunities in life than I would have otherwise. All right. Now, was this training, as you've referred to it, was that done before them, or was that done someplace? Whereas, so so that they just allowed you to be taken away, or were they involved um, in it firsthand? Some of it. Well, uh, there was a variety. Um, some of it they trained me. Like when I was little, um, right off the bat, they were uh, uh, um, being training me in ways. Um, Mom generally took me and dropped me off for the things that were the mind control training part. But I don't think she really knew what happened in a lot of it. I think she just had trust and faith and and dissociated from whatever might be going on. All right. Now, did you find that there were, did you ever get a chance to find this out since obviously while it was going on, you couldn't have possibly known if others were involved, but did you ever find out whether there was some, a number, uh, whatever that might be, three, five, seven, eight, uh, number of children that were involved with this as well uh, at the same time? At the same time as me. Um, mm, I I can't say exactly who, no. I have memories of faces and, and memories of, children but their names weren't necessarily the right ones when they were given to me but i mean i'm wondering about how this is taking place as you're speaking and for some reason i thought of you being involved with perhaps a handful who were going through that particular training was that the case or was it all one no mostly for the mind control training mostly it was it was a group of us and i don't i think i think it started out big and and shrank over the years um as people were as kids were um proved not to be worth, worth, worthwhile or went off into separate trainings. But I know at the age of three, when I used to go to what I understood to be called manners training, which was sex toy training, um, there was, there was a, a big room that a bunch of us would be in, a bunch of little boys and girls, and we were basically at, it was like sitting at school desks almost and watching films and being taught on how to, how to, how to be sex toys. And it was all about proper manners. We thought we were getting some special good training. Oh, jeez. Now, I'm only going to ask you this one question because I don't want to delve into this, but I, I have to wonder if, if this were a problem for you. If you were uh, forced to become sexually active before it would be normal for a female, mm-hmm. did that interfere with any of your biological functions? Uh, and was that an issue uh, 
as you were growing up? I don't know. I never thought. I I was very late getting my period and getting boobs, <laughs> but I don't know if that had anything <laughs> that to do with that. more or less covers it. <laughs> Pardon me? That more or less covers it. <laughs> but yeah. I do know that it started so early, I did not understand it to be abuse. Okay. It was it was it was done in a very most of it when I was young up until about the age of six or seven. Anyways, most of the sexual abuse was done in a very loving, playful manner that I actually interpreted as love and not abuse. All right, so you didn't necessarily feel any pain from something that shouldn't have been happening at at, at that age. Yeah, I did. I, I, no, I didn't because okay. mostly, anyways, the bits that were <clears throat> pain were dissociated. Okay. Uh, now, at a time. When was the time that you said that you were of no use any longer? Um, they, around the age of 10, I started to become unmanageable. They started to tr do some shutdown of some of the training then. At 12, they were really starting to seriously shut down things like the soldiers and military part, martial arts stuff. And then by, through my teens, they were training to be, training me, taking all the programming and redoing it in a way that made me, I understand that to be a good girl meant to be a whore on the street, or to be a, a good boy, a um, tough soldier meant to be in a gang hanging out with bikers or something. Well, when you said you became uh, increasingly more unmanageable, how, uh, how could that how um, could that be? I mean, I'm not questioning it, but what were your were your authors starting to act up, or was this you coming through? I mean, the core you. Um, well, the core me is all was alters. I I was I was split so soon after birth. It was never really a anything but alters. Um, but yeah, it was basically that different part that, that the amnesic barriers between them were were starting to sort of um, sh uh, not function properly. So that I would randomly talk out or use the training in a way that wasn't allowed and 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 do some good in the world. Or um, I, I just. I'm a bit of a rebel at heart, and I tend to talk a lot. And the more they tried to make me stop talking, the more I talked. So, but that, in, the, in a way, wasn't that a core, per, a core trait of the personality that you really were that was manifesting itself in your yeah. authors? It's, it's a core trait of the wholeness of me, yes. Okay. That's interesting that that would, I guess as you got older, and I, of course I'm guessing you probably know, but that there is still something, some self of you, that was starting to emerge and was somewhat, I guess, of a powerful um, uh, uh, entity, I guess I, I would say. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I believe that the way I understand it is that it's the, it's the soul-level inability to cope with all of this anymore that was what was really at, 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 the, at the core of it, and that my soul was screaming and, 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 um, and, and it was disrupting the programming. Would, did you ever find out whether or not that was also uh, happening with, with other children? Or was this something that was just kind of uh, specific and unique to you? This stuff that I went, when I was going through that, I did not know anyone else going through that. But in, in, year, in recent years, in the last decade or so, I've been in contact with a number of different survivors. Um, and it's a, it's, it's, I believe it's a lot more common than, than people think. I think that, that there is a set amount of training. Like if, you're, if they're into child porn or ch you know, child sex slaves, when you, when you hit 12 or puberty and your body changes, you're no, you're no longer going to be what they want you to be. And so they, they sort of have plans to discard people that aren't going to be useful to them anymore. Hmm. All right. Uh, that's, that's, that, that's hard for people to have to listen to and maybe even to believe that as you become, obviously, an adolescent and an adult woman, that that would necessarily make you less desirable. But are we looking at people who obviously get involved with pedophilia? Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, very much so. I mean, there was the, uh, very much the child sex slave, um, uh, child sex slave trafficking. I had to train uh, other kids um, be, when I was little, or, you know, up until up until I was useless to them, um, up until the age of twelve. And um, there, there's very much the child porn and the and the the whole um, use of children is quite prevalent, I believe. 
in certain um, groups of people and and kinds of um, kinds of groups. I don't know another word to put it. <laughs> okay. But now we don't understand also that this became somewhat of a commercial enterprise. Is that true? Um. Well, I, yeah, I believe that they were the, the reason they were doing me, making me a demonstration model. My understanding is, um, and, and my, based on my memories, is that uh, it was actually so that they could show wh- what they could do, so they could sell the training. They could sell the training. Yeah, so we can we can train you up a little sex slave, or we can train you up a little soldier that doesn't even know when they do that, or we and. I was at one point. I was in when I was ten. I was in a cage, and and they were switching me from altar to altar to show all the different possibilities of the training, and it was it was in front of, it was in one of those big covered military tent type things with all people in military uniforms, and and it was like they were bidding on the different trainings. Was was uh, I mean, could we could we assume, or do you know for a fact? Did they actually make, when you speak about it in those terms, training films? Oh, um, yeah, I'm sure they did. I never really put it in those terms, but yeah, they were, yeah. Because, I mean, much of it, most everything was filmed. And, okay. and they were marketing the training, but I think they were mostly marketing it that they would do the training and make the money. Uh, would you mind giving us a time frame from when, when this happened, uh, year-wise? Well, uh, uh, when I was in the cage. Well, when this all took place, are we, are we, I'm just trying okay, to fix I was, this. I, I was born in late 1960. Okay. And um, so the stuff when I was 10 was like in 1970, 71. The reason I say that is that we've had a guest on, um, uh, Maury, who wrote a book called Reflections in the Night. I don't know if you're familiar with that book or with her, are you? Actually, I've done as little reading of the material out there as possible because I really didn't want to taint my own stuff. I wanted to know what was mine. Okay. Because, I mean, this is a situation where somebody uh, was subject to this as well right after World War II. And the only reason why I asked you what your time frame might have been is to give us an idea of, okay. of whether this was something that happened uh, and was kind of like, if excuse the word, uh, chic in a way at a certain period or whether this st- you know, obviously started or reared its head as far as, I'm sure this happened beforehand, but certainly uh, became prevalent after World War II. And, mm-hmm. and, and really has continued, and it has continued, hasn't it? Oh, very much so. I have a I have a friend that was born in 41, 1941, and he grew up with it. And I have friends that are in their late twenties, and they've still grown up with it. Do you? And, uh, and it's advanced. I can see by listening to them. I can hear how m- my buddy that's older than me, the training wasn't as successful, as clear, as. Um, absolute um, and definitive with him as it was with me and then the people younger than me it's even more clear and solid and um, it, they've honed the, 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 the methods uh, and if, if I jump too far in time you tell me and bring me back because you know, by all means you know where you're going to go better than I but is um, what was the time about again where they figured you weren't of use anymore and about what time and how did they necessarily, if you would, kick you to the curb? Oh, um, well, it started about 1971 when I was 10, and um, I used some of the um, Voice of the Gods training to do a protest march in that ho- children's hospital I mentioned to get rules changed. And I wasn't supposed to be getting rules changed, doing things on behalf of me and other kids. And then that was sort of the last straw, um, and then they started training different altars with different things. So the, uh, the ones that were like the voice of the gods, preacher, that kind of thing, they started getting trainings where I was sent to hell, burning hell, and others were suffering because of my words, and other, the world was burning because of me. Um, the soldiers were put out into, at 12, um, out into training, um, supposedly final test, survival tests out in the wilderness um, in a military range around town here. And... Um, but they 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 were put on LSD and left in the woods to use their soldier training, and they thought they were in enemy hands, and um, got prison captured and beaten and tortured, and and then they got accused of being traitors afterwards, and and then, and then as I got older, when I was eight, it, 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 they just kept adding to the programming and altering it to make me more and more messed up, and then at eighteen. 
when I still hadn't been completely manageable, um, they uh, did a whole long, many months series of trainings where it was what they told me was they were wiping my brain and and um, the, they made me believe through through the um, TV beside me and different technologies that they used that were very funny now, but they were seemed real at the time. And they um, had me believe that they were actually taking me back to birth, wiping my brain complete, and then rebuilding my brain with the memories that I was only the ones that I was allowed to have. Well, let me ask you about this, and you may not know, this may not be uh, anywhere near your expertise, <clears throat> but, but perhaps you do know, uh, there is talk about having one's person's, uh, shall we say, their personal hard drive wiped, okay? Mm-hmm. One, um, does that happen? Uh, is it effective? And even if it is effective, can it be gotten and reached back through uh, therapy? Ah. Uh. I believe that probably today they probably do have the actual technology to do that much more re, um, truly than they did with me. Um, but they made me believe through drugs, through hypnosis, through electrical currents, all kinds of stuff, that they were wiping my brain. And they played on the TV screen beside me all my memories, and maybe not all of them, but enough that I believed it was me on there and my memories going backwards, rewind. And it very, it, I mean, it's kind of like when you've got a hypnotic suggestion that you believe yeah. it. Yep. it uh -huh. And so I, I understood they took me right back into the womb. And then they grew me up through the ages and stages with just allowable memories. And I understood, I I think it might have been more effective if they'd only done that kind of thing once. But over the years, they tried to reprogram me so many times and, and change the programming and shut it down and make it go away that it actually sent up red flags in my soul or altars or something so that it wasn't as efficient as it ought to have been, you know. Um, and I do believe that even people that have had it happen much more effectively, that if you take the time to go into your memories and really listen to the to the overall content rather than just the specific details that that there's lots of hope for getting getting healed from it yeah all right now you, you said a couple of interesting things so let me just take you back for you to comment specifically on them okay it seemed to you seem to indicate if i got this right that they did not have the technology necessarily then so they almost, I think you may mention, uh, had given you somewhat of a, a post-hypnotic suggestion or at least faked that they were wiping your uh, brain clean mm -hmm. in the idea that you would believe that and therefore it would be efficacious. Is that is that correct? That's what I understand it to be, yes. All right, so even that in a sense was kind of a, well, you know, it, it was a fakery. It was just that if they could get you to believe that, then I guess the job was done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, here's another thing, too. I mean, from what you've told us, the personality that you are, and I have no reason to believe you weren't, you seem like a very strong-willed person. Did that start to become a problem for them? Because you did have, a, obviously, a very a much more resilient, let's say, uh, spirit uh, than perhaps your average child. Yeah, I believe I did. And I, I, I don't... I I think some of it may have been the fact that I grew up with so many different kinds of things that it, like I had matriarchal and I had patriarchal and I had mind control with handler and trainer. And so it was like they each gave me different understandings of the way the world worked. And then my father gave me a couple of really important gifts in life. And one of them was that don't believe everything you hear and are told, make, ask questions and make your own decisions. And I think that was quite an empowering thing to be told, repeatedly told. The reason I asked you also about that time frame, uh, not only because to, to try to get a fix on, on when this started, well, you know, who knows how far back it really goes. I mean, it's arguable it's gone back to, you know, the time of Moloch. I mean, you know, it's, it's an evil, evil thing. But that mm -hmm. it became perhaps more of an industry, shall we say, or of uh, other usages. And the reason, again, like I said, I asked you about the time frame 
is because it's it's widely reputed that there was a doctor, Sidney uh, um, Gottlieb, I think I have that right, Gottlieb, excuse me, uh, who was very much involved with this and seems to have left an imprint uh, in many ways across the United States. Uh, mm-hmm. Have you heard about Gottlieb at all? And certainly it would he would also be, I, I believe, a character. He sounds, from, the name sounds familiar, but um, I, I'm, names are challenging for me. That was one of the big programmings that I wasn't allowed to remember. Well, Gottlieb, well, if I've got, and I hope I have that first name right, it's just I, I'm, I'm pulling this out, but Gottlieb seems to have been an individual that I think he just passed not that long ago who was involved in uh, obviously creating multiple personality disorders. But this also is a throwback, and the reason I say it seems to be somewhat on the rise from World War II is because of what Mengele did uh, in Germany. And although they said that he never made it out, uh, apparently did make it to the Western Hemisphere and continued what he was doing. Uh, So that's why I asked you, because it seemed that there was something that Mengele had run with that finally was spread after the war. And so hence, post-World War II, it seemed to be a time when this kind of situation, this kind of training, uh, this uh, ritual abuse certainly was on the rise and became probably, Tricia, more clinical. You know, I mean, actually mm-hmm. was on the drawing board and, and, a, and a, a, a viable thing to do with human beings for whatever purposes. Oh, very much so, I believe. I, I'm, I'm certain that was true. I mean, from what I understand, brainwashing became a really, um, like, the answer, the solution. And and the concept during uh, after the Second World War and and it just progressed and then when it was found that there was um, like the uh, the Manchurian Candidate thing where they sure. found that that this was brainwashing and that was effective and then it became let's make a let's aim for this and and it became a very um, yeah profitable viable and clinical yeah I I think they were honing the steps over the years, honing the procedures. Right, exactly. That's that's what I mean. I mean, they actually started building the perfect beast, more or less, through much more scientific and probably more uh, efficacious methods. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably you uh, caught what might have been one of the last crude uh, 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 types of training that there was. I kind of get that impression, yeah, okay. because the people I know that are younger than me, it seems to have been... Very similar types of things that were done to me, very similar approaches to coping with things, um, to training things in and to discarding and stuff. And it seems to me that, yeah, I probably was one of the last experimental level. All right. Again, uh, Trish, uh, do you have a, a website where you post anything or a blog spot? Or is there any no, place I that you No, I don't at this point, no. Um, I have I have a, an email and... Um, uh, what was the rest of your question? <laughs> oh no, no. Uh, the thing was, and uh, and I would, I think I know one of the answers to this. But at, at this point, we, you know, we should talk about that. First of all, uh, it, it is Trish Fotheringham. She is a victim of ritual abuse. Uh, she has contributed a chapter to the book Ritual Abuse in the 21st Century, and that was edited by the Noblitz. You heard them on the show last July. Ellen Lachter was involved in that too. A name that's familiar to many of you if you've listened to the show across years. And and obviously Trish is a uh, uh, the chapter is in there as well. But are there places you would have people go off the top of your head? And if not, we can always add this to the links that go with your show, uh, your audio as well, where people can find out more about this, sites that you feel are reputable, and we'll give people the real skinny on what goes on. I would suggest going to Ellen Lachter's um, website, um, the www.endritualabuse.org. That's right. Okay. And I think when I wrote it on that paper for you, I added an extra dot that's not supposed to be there. Oh. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, go ahead. She has, she has um, it seems to me, a, quite a comprehensive list of, of links and books and things like that. And also in the, the Ritual Abuse in the 21st Century book, in Ellen's chapter, Chapter 4, there's pages and pages and pages of book references in it, too. Yeah, so and, that would be my recommendation, because I really don't know what's out there. Well, there may be a lot of things out there, but we don't know how good they are. But at least we know that, that this is uh, uh, obviously a good website. And I'll say that Ellen has really built that up from the old days. Uh, it's become much more comprehensive, and uh, and she split off herself, I think, from uh, being involved in another hosting service. So, uh, and ritualabuse.org is that uh, website that Trish is talking about. 
Yeah, and ritual abuse. But I, yeah, I, well, that, that's the Jersey of me. I don't, I don't speak like everyone else does. What did I say? <laughs> um, well, you just said ritual abuse, and it's and, and, and ritual, ritual right, abuse. And ritual abuse, and I have it, like I said, in front of me, so I should know better. Uh, <laughs> and I'm just scrolling through her resources to see if she has any links in, in particular. Uh, yeah, she does. So I just would say to folks, too, if you do go to nritualabuse.org, you'll find out that under links and other resources, uh, there are other ones that I, I guess uh, Ellen believes are good, and I don't think you'd have any problem with that, Trish, right? No, I'd recommend anything that she recommends because she seems to me very discerning. Yeah, uh, I would say so, and uh, she's been very generous with her time to come on uh, to, uh, to speak about this situation, like we said, remains a very hidden and dirty secret uh, mm -hmm. in our societies and cultures. So uh, you talked about reprogramming, right? There were attempts yeah. to reprogram you? Yes. Okay, and what, what ages did that take place, and what did they expect necessarily to happen? Were they trying to do something new? Were they trying to end something old or what? Um, generally take something old and change it to something new or put an end to it. Um, for example, the ones that were Oracle and um, Voice of the Gods, they were using me to, to, for that purpose. And then when I wasn't turning out, uh, turning out to say their words when, when I was supposed to and stuff, then they started training these parts, those parts, to be afraid of their words so, and to not speak out. Because, and they would make other people suffer um, so that I wouldn't speak out. And then eventually they just literally sent these parts to live in hell, and they, were, they lived in hell for, until I found them in therapy. Well, when you say this bit about Oracle slash Voice of the Gods, what was that going to be about? Were you supposed to, uh, or would somebody who was successfully uh, trained, would they be used as, as some kind of child savant or some kind of uh, mystic whose prophecies perhaps would be embraced? That that would be yeah that would be one one yeah very much so you um, anything where you'd have someone who ha you know a prophet or a mystic or a, an evangelist um, a lot of the training was focused on rallying the crowds rallying the people um, the, and the and the the mechanisms for doing that of of um, what to say and and how to rouse people's emotions and get them to do what you want them to do rather than what they want them to do or what do they want to do uh, I don't mean to digress in other words I'm going to but I don't want it to go that far but boy I've got to ask you this and it may not be in your purview to answer what I would do is ask you if you felt qualified enough and certainly from what you experienced and what you have studied later on there is I would call it a counterfeit uh movement it may not have yet come to fruition it may counterfeiting uh what's uh, the bible might state about an exceptional group of young people in times to come could it be possible that certain select children and this could be across the country across the the, the hemisphere or across the world could it be possible to train children perhaps perhaps exceptional in their abilities, in their regular self, to be something like what you've said that, that you were trained to do, and that is be an oracle, uh, be somewhat uh, supposedly hooked into God. Is that, would, you, would you think that's possible? Would you rather pass on that? or? Oh, no, I'm quite sure that's possible. I'm quite sure it's already going on and that many of them have grown up and are out there putting those kinds of messages out right now. Well, I'm thinking in particular, and I'm going to be the one that mentions this, so... This is not Trisha saying this, unless she wants to speak to it. She doesn't have to. But some some of this stuff I've been hearing about star children and indigo children, I'm starting to wonder about, and whether or not something is going on. But it's not from, uh, shall we say, the Lord, but uh, something quite different. Okay, I would speak to that. I would say that I I do believe the, the star children and the indigo children are advanced children. Apo I, my apologies for the phone in the background. I have no control over that one. That's okay. Um, Okay. <laughs> um, I do believe that the star children and indigo children are actual, um, highly evolved children being born into the world at this point because critical mass has accrued and their wi their brains are wired up more than than ours were. Okay. Um, but I also believe that those children and others are being used as tools. 
Okay, and like I said, that that's a that's a that's like three hour show in itself. <laughs> but uh, it, it obviously, from what you told me, it did good rise to me thinking about that. Now you talked mm-hmm. about the reprogramming, so they actually try to update you more or less. Yes, they 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 they. It, it's like um, okay, we don't want you doing this anymore. This is the new rules. This is the new the the new thing that you're supposed to focus on, and um, and then it, it, it's an attempt partly to make the stuff that doesn't work go away or be hit, you know locked away, and it's also just. Um, evolution sometimes like you know you're not a little child anymore you're not going to be um prime use for for child pedophilia and porn so then are we going to make you into a breeder now that you can have babies that didn't happen to me but um are they going to are we going to make you into a high class whore that does spying for us and and so it's 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 um adjusting the plan as time goes by do you, uh, Adjusting do you know, the programming. Do you know? Uh, well, uh, let me let me frame this next question by saying that I had a guest on a number of years ago, and I won't name who that individual is. But that individual also couldn't speak to certain things that individual did because it apparently it included uh, murder. Mm. Now, l- let me ask you: Do you know of of any incidences where those like yourself? were possibly used as assassins, not necessarily in the classic way, uh, obviously, uh, as we uh, we see most of them, but in some other ways. Was there anything that involved perhaps uh, this kind of thing? And especially, as you well know, we can all see a scenario where a woman might be sent to seduce some kind of head of state or somebody who's important or a spy or whatever, and of course, through the seduction, uh, snuff the, uh, the target. Mm-hmm. Was that... A possibility, uh, not for you necessarily. Well, that was what one of my my spy alter was sort of being trained for, um, but I think it was more for demonstration purposes than actual making me do that in the long term. But um, as I understand it, my brother um, was a trained assassin. Your brother. He told me that back in the eighties, and I didn't believe him. I didn't have my memories back then, and I thought he was crazy. Would that have been in the classic uh, Manchurian Candidate? Uh, um, prototype with uh, uh, being one that's using firearms, or by any means necessary. Actually, I be- from what I what he said, I believe it wasn't actually that he didn't remember. He just had really um, twisted rationing ra- rationale for it and reasoning for it. He believed he was cleaning the streets and cleaning the city and cleaning the world. Oh, so he might have been very aware, of what he, or somewhat aware of what he was doing. Yeah, yeah. From what I understand, he was fully aware of it when he talked to me about it in the summer of, of 1987 he was giving me uh, details and 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 things i i i couldn't believe at the time so in his case it might have been that he was very I- ideologically driven and felt yes. that he was p- performing a, a service that's how the training works okay. is they make um they make your understanding fit what they want you to do they make your beliefs a uh, uh, fit and so if, if you're supposed to be, um, say, a, a, a sex slave, the training is that that's how you show love. That's how you make a man happy. That's how you make a woman happy. That's how you be worthwhile. That's how you be a good girl or a good boy. If you're a soldier, being trained for a soldier, you're trained to be cold and detached and do it, take orders. And depending on the level you're at, you might be trained to think for yourself in the process. But you are very much trained into the belief system that this this use of force in these situations, these are the right ways to deal with things. Uh, what I'm going to jump to, and that is, at the time when you basically were released, uh, if I'm missing anything, let me know. Uh, but if not, uh, can you can you recreate the scenario where, like we said before, you got kicked to the curb? Okay, um, that was when I was 18 after a long, se- um, many months um, of a series of, of um, what I called the um, brain wipe and, and then the finalized with the, what was I called the joint lock where they um, sealed it all in with two different altars, supposedly. I don't know how they did it exactly, um, but it's smoking a, 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 a marijuana joint across a fence in agreement that they would keep the secret. And um, another altar being uh, wedded to the gate that locked it all away. 
and uh, strange stuff. And um, they they did all they did the brain wipe, they did the reprogramming, and the and the, the false life given to me of what I was supposed to remember had happened. And then um, when I had reached a point where I was so crazy um, with with the different alters trying to make sense of things and trying to be good and trying to learn all this stuff and our brains had been wiped and our trainings had been wiped and what was real and what wasn't um and they the the final pieces of the of the wedded to the gate and stuff had been happening and then they just literally left me on the side of the road um by the training place and i went on and was confused and depressed and suicidal for a very long time <laughs> Well, <clears throat> it was it was just kind of like they just left me then afterwards, and I'm pretty. I, I, the way I understand is that they did watch me. They have paid attention. Um, they have tried to trigger me into proper behavior over the years, but that they learned that the more that they try and make me do what I'm told, the more that I don't. So they just left me. But the the trainings at 18 were very much about other people suffering. If I didn't listen and, and, and anybody I loved would suffer if I didn't follow those rules? Oh, so it's, it's interesting. and I, I, I guess I often see this now that the best way to uh, get somebody in line is not necessarily to uh, threaten their own life, but to threaten the lives of those who they love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you grow up with torture, you get pretty used to it. And you have to do an awful lot of nasty stuff before it really becomes something that is worth selling your soul for. But if you if you have ever watched someone you love suffer, you know how hard and painful that is. And to know that you anything you do will cause people you care about to be hurt, to suffer, um, that that has a great deterrent. Have you? Uh, can you say whether or not the last time you know that you were contacted? Um, the last time I know for sure that I was contacted was when I was first remembering the, the stuff about the joint lock back in the late 90s and they had my therapist's office bugged and I came out to catch the bus and I was waiting at the bus stop and this man, <laughs> it was just like out of the movies. He was dressed in black and he was saying all the trigger code words and how uh, telling me all these, th all these things and I had undone enough that all I could do was laugh at, at what he was saying and say, and just sort of come back with, yeah, and if that happens, well, then that happens, kinds of. It was just very strange and bizarre. And I got home, and I, I was like, what was that about? That was very strange. And then a little while later, I realized, I just got a visit from a, or a, a contact from a man in black, like in the movies. It was, it was absurd. <laughs> <clears throat> um, do you have a family? Yeah, well... Um, I have a family, most, my brother, my, my mother, a um, couple of half-sisters, nieces and nephews and stuff. Um, most of them I'm in no contact with, um, and I have a son that's grown up now. Okay. Uh, apparently, even though you're speaking, and I think I know why this is, but I would rather have you say so, uh, you're speaking out, and that could be dangerous, and yet, nothing's being attempted upon you or those you love uh is that because they feel that nobody's really paying attention to this and they and that you know mainstream news or whatever would turn around and just immediately demonize you or anybody else that would say this i think they probably have that belief to some extent but i i think they've also learned that uh, stay the heck away from me because you're just going to make me do more harm to you and if they do any damage to me or mine at this point it just makes everything i have to say far more credible well, then, that, then, then I would seem that their hope is just leave it alone. Yeah, and yeah. You, you, and, you know, people like yourself are not made martyrs. Hopefully, Mass America, or in this case, Canada as well, uh, will just ignore this whole thing as being, you know, the province of uh, spy movies. Mm, um, I think that might be some of it, but I think it's also that within the framework of the rules that I was given, I'm, uh, I'm not supposed to say names, tell who did it, um, give specific details of that sort, I and I haven't done that. What I've done is I've talked about my experiences, my understandings, how I heal, um, how things are done. But I, so I haven't actually stepped okay. out of the rules of the agreement. So in other words, you didn't identify anybody specifically, and because not you did, by name, right? <laughs> you just talk about the process and just what you're talking about right here. 
Mm-hmm. The only ones I've really identified by name are, are my own family. Okay. Uh, again, now, are, are you in a position now where you can say you've been thoroughly healed? Is that a situation that never happens? Uh, what is the part of therapy? Does it have to last forever? Or how does that all work now, Tricia? Um, well, I, um, I'm not multiple anymore. Um, it's almost two years. I've been one whole person for the first time. <laughs> it never was before. Okay. Um, I spent 17 years in therapy every week. Um, and at some point, I reached the point where the therapy process of standard psychotherapy and um, EMDR and different things like that weren't really helping me anymore. I had reached the limits of what that could do for me. And I've um, taken to more spiritual spiritual kinds of focus on healing on my healing at this point and 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 healing my self esteem and healing my um, place in the world, that kind of thing. I don't think the healing ever completely ends, but you stop needing to fix yourself and you and you more it's more about um, getting on with life and being functional and just um, uh, dealing with things that m- impede or or affect your life in ways you don't in ways I don't want anymore how long was it after you were quote discarded that you started to realize something went on and, and boy that must have been some kind of uh, epiphany if you will when you realize wow something's going on inside of me and I have to find out what that is it was a it was a heck of a shock. I was I was thirty years old, or twenty nine years old, and I went off to college, social work college, and um, learning to be a social worker. And we got the day that we uh, just a few weeks into the program, um, we got a day where they, they the whole focus was on all the different types of abuse and what they are, and and how you recognize them. And I just. I just was completely unglued by that and had to go to my instructor in tears, help, I'm abusing my child. Everything I know is abuse. My whole life is abuse. And then I went to, he sent me to a therapist, and um, the first thing she did was, I mean, my biggest concern at the time was doing right for my son. And th- this this therapist was a parenting therapist, and the first thing she asked me was, how were you parented? What did your parents do when you got in trouble? And I said, well, dad counted to ten. And she said, what happened when he got to 10? Uh, I don't know. I never let him get there because his hand was bigger than my butt. <laughs> and she says, how do you know that? And I go, I, I don't know. And we discovered, I remembered most of my daily life, every house we lived in, most of my friends, but I didn't remember being disciplined. I didn't remember my own bedrooms. Certain things were very significantly blank. Missing, yeah. And that was the first inkling of anything. And then just trying to get through the rest of that college year was uh, my brain was uh, all the walls were starting to crumble. And within a few months um, after that, like it was a year long course, and, and a few within a few months after that, I was in therapy and we were finding the altars because they were just speaking out. Did you have any uh, professors, instructors, or even perhaps a friend in, in a school that uh, could act as a touchstone, somebody you could share with? Mm. I've been very blessed, and, and I think it's my nature to talk to people. And so I, I was always able to have someone to, to share with, to talk with. And actually, in the first few years of therapy, I told everyone and traumatized all kinds of people because I didn't know the content was so hard for them. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, in, in that situation with, with the healing that took place, was there anything... Uh, such as self-loathing or whatever that had to be stopped. Was it? Did you hate yourself? Were you ashamed for yourself, or was that not an issue? Oh yeah, that was always an issue. It, it's still even just before this interview today. I'm having. I was having a panic attack. That oh, I don't have anything of value to say. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just like. <laughs> so the the doubt and the uh, and the uh, the fear still come in that um, I I'm I'm going to say the wrong thing and hurt somebody or. Um, and the self-loathing, self-hate, um, that one kind of ties in with any kind of having harmed anyone else. It's really hard to completely rid yourself of that um, self, self-hate, self self-disgust. Well, so you're saying that there's a feeling of guilt not knowing if you might have harmed somebody. Of course, you're never going to know, so you're going to have to, I guess, quote, get over that. But 
I mean, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying that in a crass way. It's just that that's that's something you have to surmount because there's no way you're ever going to be able to know. Yes. And even yes. if well, and even if I know I hurt people when I was young. I know okay. I hurt people when before this, but. I can't know if if this is going to hurt anybody, what I'm talking right now, but I have to have a, a face that everything that has happened to me led me to here to be the person saying these things, and I'm doing my best to have integrity in it and make sure to claim it as my experience, Do you get not to a, necessarily others. They always say this is as hardest, and I kind of believe it's true, but is there a point where you have to come to some kind of self-forgiveness? Yes. Oh, yes. You have to forgive yourself um I had to, I'm still learning, I'm, that's still one that I'm working on, is forgiving myself for um, for the choices I made when they weren't really choices when I was little. I mean, not, none of that was choice when I was a child, um, but it was set up often to look like a choice. Um, uh, and that the choices I made as an adult were based on the best I could manage at the time, and that I have improved that best, and that my choices are wiser and healthier now. And therefore, forgive myself. I'm human. I'm not superhuman. I'm not perfect. Nobody is. Well, <laughs> no, without a doubt. Uh, but uh, but I'm also wondering too. Uh, is there also something you have to do with the forgiveness process? However, that works out, and that may not be the best word, but for those who quote did that to you. Oh, very much so. For me, it's it's an integral part of it all. Um, if I am a product of what my experiences were and what I came to understand and believe about myself and the world, that's just as true for everyone else. And everybody that hurt me went through their experiences that taught them that was the way to be. And they are doing the best they know how within the framework of their understanding of the way the world works. And they, in a lot of ways, are... At least as well, I mean, they had to have been victims to start out, or they would not have learned to do those things. Um, and in, in a lot of ways, if they're still in the perpetration of that kind of stuff, they're still far more victim than I am. Because they're still victim of beliefs that their soul can't be happy with, that their soul must be screaming about. They're still victim of beliefs that are, are mm. having them add fuel to the fire all the time about how bad they are. Yeah, that's true. I mean, when you when you think about just what kind of value process or, or uh, um, h- how anyone can lo- what their possible view of the world could be like, and how they make that all right, or or what happens to them. I mean, not that we're concerned about that, but you have to wonder, you know, what is it about another human being that that could behave in that capacity? That, that is unconscionable for most people. And I don't know what it's like for anyone else who's involved in that. To go on, I, I just wonder sometimes too if there's a self-destruction mechanism in that that uh, people like yourself who were victims never get to see. Not that you would rejoice in that, but whether or not you know there is a very uh, uh, shall we say fitting and nasty end to their existence. Oh, there is. Yes, and and I mean, their souls are screaming about what they're doing, even if they can't hear it, feel it. They're they're not happy people. You I'm, don't go around hurting people and be happy. No, exactly. Uh, with what you went through, what you know you went through, uh, how has that impacted the way that you look at the life you've had past that time and to the future? Uh, does it make you more appreciative, or are you bitter, or are you uh, somewhat concerned about the future, not only yours but the world's? I mean, how does that? What kind of glasses do you look at the world through because of what you did go through? Um, I think it changes daily sometimes or hourly, <laughs> depending on my emotional state and how tired I am. Um, but generally, I, I'm, I'm a believer in past lives and, and evolution of the human spirit and soul through, through, um, well, uh, uh, through human experiences. And I um, believe that I came into this life to go through that hell, to learn the things that I've learned so that somebody can say the things that I'm saying now. And oddly enough, that is very comforting for me. It, it makes everything that I went through have some value. And it, it's like it was my path from the start. And mu- much of my life, I've been so focused on healing my physical body, my mental, emotional, spirit, etc. That's all I could focus on was that and parenting. Whereas now, I actually am so much improved um, in all forms of my health. And I have this apparently helpful message to give to the world. It's like 
now my future begins. I'm finished therapy, I'm one whole person, and now I get to really contribute in a positive way and find this thing called joy in life and wonderful new adventures and experiences and things that, that just were, were not even within my realm of, of um, conceiving before. Do you feel you've gotten to a point where a lot of people who haven't gotten through, haven't gone through what you have, have never gotten to? And, yeah. And, and that is uh, being able to take every individual on an, on an individual basis and treat them just as you find them and not uh, deal with others in whatever kind of uh, segment of life they may be in, regardless of race or creed or anything else. Can you actually take people at, just for themselves without having any kind of perceived uh, attitudes towards them? It's interesting. I can in some ways and not in other ways. When I look at people as a group, um, it's much easier to look at um, the, the positives and, and just sort of think of their soul, uh, the child in, that, in them, that kind of thing. On an individual basis, one-on-one, -on -one, or when I'm actually with people, I'm very much an open-hearted, connect to their soul um, I get along with people that nobody else gets along with, and I bring out the good in people because of that. Um, at the same time, as if, I, if I've still got some issues of my own that I haven't finished clearing up on it, um, like d dealing with men that I might find attractive, oh, my goodness, I have a lot of issues with that. <laughs> it, it, it twists me in knots, and I forget their soul in that process, and I color it with my past still. Okay. But it, that's a... Just about the only area left that I do that. Do you think you'll see a time when that will uh, also fade oh, away? Oh, yes. I expect everything else has. This will, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, real quick, if you don't mind, uh, at, at least one question. Um, we've gone over a little bit, and, and uh, I thank you for staying a little overtime with us. I'm uh, enjoying this. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, again, I, I don't want to be sappy and say I hope there's something therapeutic in this for you, but I do hope there is. And certainly other people, uh, and I'll tell you, uh, some people have written me, especially after the Noblitz and, uh, and Lachter were on and said they wanted to listen, but they just had to walk away because they had some issues also. So, I mean, it's a very powerful thing, and some people have not come around. Uh, mm -hmm. to where you have, and I, I'm sure you can fully understand that, and you can only hope that somehow, some way, that they can find some, some peace and some surcease from all this, you know? Mm -hmm. so, uh, I've, noticed, I've noticed something, that even a year ago, when, um, when I was talking about the book, um, people were still glazing over at, at just the first two words, ritual abuse. They, they glazed right over and disappeared. They, they couldn't hear it. And yet by the fall, by three months ago, all over the place, hairdressers and everybody wants to know about it. Well, so I think we've hit some critical mass of the world being a little more open-minded. At least I'm hoping so. <laughs> well, yeah. I, and, but, you know, and yet I have to follow, well, I don't have to, but I am going to follow up with this question because I think this is, well, it doesn't matter what I think. Uh, we down here in the States have uh, the milk carton children. Do you know what I'm referring to? You have what? The milk carton children, we call them. Oh, the ones that go missing, yes. Well, do you believe, do you, do you know for a fact, or do you suspect that many of these children may have been given over, not necessarily by their families, who knows, through abductions or whatever, could be through the family. Do you believe that uh, these children, and it seems to be a rise in the numbers that have been taking place in whatever amount of time, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Was it 10 years ago? Was it 20 years ago? Do you believe that there is a, a certain industry out there or at least uh, our children may be disappearing uh, because of what you went through? I mean, that, that kind of practice? I have no doubt about it. I was one of the ones that was they were brought to the train. Uh, would you be? Uh, could you clarify what you uh, mean? At ten years, at ten years old, eleven years old, twelve years old, um, it, it wasn't just me being part of the child sex slave trafficking stuff. I was actually my grandfather was um, bringing them on to the yacht that the the, the big shots um, ha had that they um, trained a lot of the children on, and they, the children quite a, at, at, when I was ten, eleven, twelve, the children were handed over to me for some of their initial training. I... as sex slaves and stuff. And the, the, the way that I understand it is that kids are gathered from the East Coast, brought out to the West Coast, and shipped off to Asia. They're gathered from the West Coast, 
taken to the East Coast and shipped off to Europe, and then it goes out the same way over in Europe and Asia, too. So we truly do have a trade. We have an international trade, don't we? We do, very yes. much so. Okay. And, and there's also, in addition to the ones that are known about that go missing, there's a whole lot of children that are born and never registered. Never, n- the world does not know they exist. And they are nothing but um, slaves and, and tools and animals, really, right. the way they're treated. Just to follow up to that question, I had written this down as a note, and I'm not saying that all institutions are like this, but can we assume orphanages uh, are sometimes fertile ground for these, uh, uh, these types that would take children away? Well, either take them away or, uh, in my experience, a lot of the institutions of that sort and, and other, uh, I mean, Lots of kinds of institutions, if they're not taking them away, they're still making use of them there. All right, we've been speaking with Trish Fotheringham, and that's with an O, but you'll know that when you see her uh, name up with her audio on the home page. Uh, Trish, do me a favor now. Uh, tell us about the book, the, the, the name of the chapter that you have there, and also you've got something else coming out, don't you, in the form of a DVD? Yes. Um, my chapter in that ritual abuse in the 21st century um, is, my chapter is called Patterns in Mind Control, a first-person account. Uh, the ending epilogue to that, um, entitled The Moral of My Story, is online at um, Ellen Lachter's website and ritualabuse.org okay. under Healing and Psychotherapy. And also, um, Ellen came up in October and interviewed me and um uh, we um, are almost finished. It'll be available soon on DVD, and it's an, um, entitled "Healing from Ritual Abuse and Mind Control." Survivor Trish Fotheringham speaks out, and that is um, about two and a half hours of her interviewing me on healing and some of the kinds of things you've been asking me about too. Um, primarily focused on things like um, tips and ideas and suggestions for therapists, clergy, survivors. Okay. And it includes the moral of the story being read by me and some of my journal artwork that actually shows what my inner world looked like when I found it as it evolved and uh, and what it was like just before I ceased to be multiple. Oh, boy. Oh, that yeah. Must be, that must be something. Holy mackerel, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's um, about... Well, I think we've got it down to one DVD now, but there for a while it was looking like it was going to be three. <laughs> Somehow that doesn't and, surprise uh, me with you two guys, but... <laughs> <laughs> Ellen is thinking that she may well make this um, the first in a series Seriously. with other survivors if she's able to. Yeah, that that would make sense. That would make mm-hmm. sense. So uh, we can, I guess, we can look for that DV, DVD perhaps uh, in the next few months. Yes. Well, um, we're just we're just finalizing the final draft, and then there's okay. all the copying and packaging and stuff. But right. yeah, and it'll be advertised on Ellen's website for sure, and she'll send out notification to anybody on her mailing list. You know, and I'd like to have Ellen come on, too, when that, when that time is at hand uh, to be able to uh, promote that. And also, we can catch up on what's taking place uh, with her work uh, since mm-hmm. the last time she was on, which is now you know, about, what, eight months. So, uh, Listen, uh, Trish, I want to thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, uh, let's see. Uh, how, how do you uh, feel about uh, email? Um, are oh, you taking I'm, email? I'm, I'm, I'm fine with email. It's rainbow Trish at myself.com All right, well thank you for that and honestly, usually the people who contact you are those who are very, very sincere so uh, we don't usually have uh, the, the, the general noise that comes with uh, politics and other things, this is a whole different deal so well, thanks Even if anybody phones with criticism and, and nasties they're still doing what they sincerely <laughs> believe <laughs> Well you do have a good attitude <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, well, listen Trish, thanks a lot uh, and perhaps we'll, we'll uh, be able to do this again, but certainly I'll look for that with Ellen and see if we can pick up where you and I left off. Thank you very much for having me on, and I'd love to come back on. (laughs) Okay, Trish. Bye-bye now.